Hello and welcome to Student Affairs Live, the online learning community for student affairs professionals and scholars in higher education. I am your host, Heather Shagasser from Michigan State University. Today I am featuring the co-authors of Designing for Learning, Creating Environments for Student Success. You can participate in our learning community today by following along live on Twitter and tweeting to the Higher Ed Live hashtag. Thank you to my friend Valerie Ruska from Indiana University for once again monitoring today's Student Affairs Live back channel. Before we get on with the show, I need to spend a moment recognizing our sponsors. Student Affairs Live is a part of the Higher Ed Live Network, where free live webcasts allow viewers to share knowledge and participate in discussions around the most current issues in Student Affairs. You can tune in to Student Affairs Live with my incredible co-host and friend, Tony Duty every other Wednesday uh, this fall at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. In higher ed, the degree is the product. Your program pages are some of the most marketing critical on your website. If you're interested in getting M. Stoner's model to build effective program pages and spend some quality time with one of their experts, check out the link that we're about to tweet so that you can learn more. Student Affairs Live is also exclusively sponsored by ACPA, College Student Educators International. ACPA strategic partnership with Higher Ed Live calls attention to the pairing of innovative professional development delivery with the strength of a renowned professional association. For the past 20 years, ACPA's publication about campus has brought student learning to the forefront of higher education and student affairs. Click on the link we're tweeting out now to read more about this unique publication. Now on with today's show. To me, campus environments are always a relevant topic, but as I have thought about the critical events this week taking place at the University of Missouri, I can't help but draw connections between how things have unfolded and the topic of today's show. Environments are critical for student, ex for student success, and this includes for inclusion and safety, for engagement and community, and certainly for learning. So I'm thrilled to be joined today by the two people who I have long admired and thought of as thought leaders in this conversation around campus environments. To here talking about the new edition of their book, Designing for Learning, Creating Campus Environments for Student Success, which is an update from the previous book, which is long considered canon in student affairs, education by design, creating campus environments that work. So joining me today are Dr. Carney Strange, Professor Emeritus from Bowling Green State University. Hi, Carney. Hi, Heather. And Dr. James Banning, Professor Emeritus from Colorado State University. Hi, Jim. Good morning. Thank you so much to both of you for joining me. I'm, I'm thrilled to have this topic on Student Affairs Live. So I'm going to start by asking each of you to talk a little bit about your background. Um, how, through your careers, did you become interested in environments on campus? Um, and then how did you come together to, to happen to write this book? Uh, so, Jim, do you want to start us off? Sure. Uh, when I was thinking about uh, how to introduce myself, I realized that uh, I've been involved in an educational setting, either as a student or administrator or faculty member for some 72 years. So I figured I'd better reduce the amount of time I talked about rather than all of that. So some of the highlights. Uh, I grew up in a small rural community in Kansas. Uh, went off to a church-related institution for my bachelor's degree. Ended up getting a PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Colorado Boulder. And uh, uh, went on from there to work for the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education and then as Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at the University of Missouri for five years and then on to uh, Colorado State University as Vice President for Student Affairs and then uh, some 20 some years teaching in Student Affairs uh, programs in the School of Education and the Department of Psychology here at Colorado uh, state. My interest in environments uh, really relate to a critical event uh, and given what's happening across the country now in terms of protests I'll try to make it short but uh, 
it was in the middle 60s and I was director of the counseling center at the University of Colorado and I got a call from the vice president of student affairs wondering if I could get all the hippies and the protesters into some kind of group therapy okay uh, he was well-meaning uh, he was concerned about the campus and about students but uh, I don't know how I responded to that request on the phone but after I put the phone down uh, I had a moment of sort of a major change in, in my life that as a clinical psychologist and psychotherapist I had really trained people to think that way that if there's an issue it must be an interpersonal issue and so I became very interested at that point in time in uh, and it was it was a part of the time. It was a part of the generation. We had the anti-war movement. We had the feminist movement. We had a number of issues around uh, increasing uh, opportunities for ethnic minority com communities, the LGBT communities. All of those things suggest that we need major change, not just psychotherapy change. Even though psychotherapy, obviously, is a, an area that I still appreciate and and support. So. That's how I got involved in environments, and I went on to Wichi to uh, work with how to develop models and how to that uh, effort with many other people came the notion of campus ecology. Uh, how Carney and I got together, uh, Carney invited me, <laughs> uh, and uh, as I look back over those 70 some years, I just mentioned to Carney a minute ago that one of the major highlights of that is the opportunity to have been a part of these two books uh, under Carney's leadership uh, and putting this together. So, um, you know, I've had some experiences in a variety of parts of student affairs, and uh, I think that should be a sufficient introduction to at this point. Awesome. Thank you so much. Carney, share with us a little bit about your path and, and how you got interested in environments. Well, in spite of what uh, some may uh, wonder, I was not born on a mountaintop in Tennessee. Actually, I was a Hoosier uh, by birth, uh, southern Indiana. And uh, my college years, to, to shorten this uh, journey a little bit, my college years were 1965 to 1969. So I was probably one of those that was uh, giving Jim headaches, uh, so to speak. Uh, he in an administrative position, and me as a as a student. Uh, those were very very important years for me for all of us. But uh, that was a time when uh, hardly ever did we consider the question, "What are you going to do in life?" It was always, "What do you believe in in life?" And so that sort of uh, prepared me to wander a bit, I guess, after my undergrad years. Uh, I taught junior high school. Uh, I uh, worked as a community organizer. I worked in the area of addictions, uh, intervention, that sort of thing. Uh, that eventually led to an opportunity at the University of Iowa to uh, uh, join a program that was sponsored by the uh, NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse, um, and they were offering fellowships in, uh, with that as a focus and when I got to the University of Iowa they encouraged us to select an area that we could use as a uh, sort of an adjunct piece and for me that was college student personnel, CSP as we uh, called it then. Um, that uh, was an opportunity where I uh, was versed early on in my formal coursework in some of the ideas of a person by the name of Kurt Lewin or Kurt Levine. Uh, he was a faculty member at the University of Iowa in psychology uh, in the late 1940s. Now I wasn't around then, but uh, his ideas persisted and the idea of uh, behavior as a function of the person environment was a seminal piece that was planted in me that I used to sort of frame and understand what was going on in colleges and universities. Uh, the long and short of this is the uh, focus on drug alcohol counseling took a second seat in my own uh, interest and the focus on what happens to college students and, and where they go, uh, that came to the front. Uh, part of the, that coursework um, there was a uh, person by the name of Ursula Delworth who was the director of our uh, counseling center. Jim knew her, worked with her. Uh, 
she organized a sort of an informal seminar on campus environments. This must have been about 1974 or 5, somewhere around there. <clears throat> the whole notion of campus ecology was just beginning to, uh, to sort of appear. Um, that was a, a term that certainly in the 60s we all thought of the frog in the pond uh, became a very useful concept in understanding what happens on college campuses. So we, we had this seminar and in that seminar I was uh, introduced to the work of my colleague James Banning and so I read a few pieces on that. Uh, some of the early documents that came out of the Wichy uh, Enterprise, Western Interstate Commission on Higher Education on Campus Ecology. Um, so that helped me understand the E component of Lewin's paradigm. Uh, we had new coursework beginning in how do students learn, develop, and grow. That was the P component. The E component we didn't have uh, as a parallel kind of uh, academic experience and yet in graduate school. Um, so in 1979, after I took my uh, first and only faculty position at Bowling Green State University, uh, I met up with uh, Nancy Evans. Nancy was a counseling psychologist. Um, she was also at the University of Iowa. We both landed in Bowling Green, Ohio the same fall. And I said, uh, Nancy, let's, uh, let's get you involved in teaching over here if you'd like. And so I remember in my apartment in uh, Maple Street in Bowling Green, we sat and banged out what we uh, thought of our first version of a course on campus environments. And uh, we did that. We taught that in the spring of 1979. Uh, I continued to teach that all the way up until 2013, uh, where I had my last formal go around with that course. So it's been a, uh, a career-long kind of interest of mine. Um, I don't know that anyone else has been picking up this, this cause, but um, anyway, uh, that led to all of this for me. Awesome. Well, I am just thrilled to have both of you on the show, and I, my kind of small little piece of that story uh, that I resonate with is that I was able to take a class from, from you, Dr. Bannon, Banning, when I was a graduate student at Colorado State in the, in the SAHI program. So it's great to be back and having this conversation uh, with, with you all and talking about environments as well. Um, so I want to know about the, the transition from the previous version in 2001 to now the 2015 version. Carney, can you give us kind of a, a Cliff Notes version of what, um, how the first edition of your work has evolved into this edition? Sure. Um, and by the way, while uh, as a preface to that, if anyone is interested in a formal transition guide, I've written such a thing, and I'd be happy if they uh, simply email me, strange at bgsu.edu. I'll be happy to send them a copy of that. Great. Uh, so um, the difference between the two volumes, the fundamental structure of both volumes are identical, and they sort of begin and lay out uh, the discussion in two big pieces. One is, uh, if you're interested in the campus environment, what do you look at? What counts as the, the campus environment? And those are the four pieces uh, that really came out of some study of uh, a person by the name of Rudolf Moos, uh, who was busy out there kind of synthesizing a lot of pieces about uh, environments as he related them to uh, hospitals and other settings such as those uh, therapy settings. Um, we translate those into the four pieces that we have. The human aggregate, the influence of the collection of people in a setting, uh, the obviously the physical environment and the layout and design of that, uh, the way things are organized to um, you know to reach certain purposes or fulfill certain purposes and then finally uh, what we called, and I and early on I called the perceptual environment, but it's the socially constructed components. So that's the first half of both books. The second half is how do you use these pieces and what do you do with them? And that is laid out in terms of a hierarchy of environmental design. Uh, so both books uh, essentially follow that. 
Now, what has changed uh, since the first version? Uh, certainly, there has been a, a whole range of new topics about campus environments that has emerged in our literature. Um, I think of pieces like universal design. That didn't exist or was barely referenced uh, prior to our first version. I think about the focus on active learning and active learning spaces and their design. Uh, architects have picked up on a lot of this and, and both the first volume and I expect the second volume will be uh, readily available in many architectural design firms. Um, so they've picked up this on designing learning spaces. I think about discussions of safe spaces, about brave spaces, uh, especially as uh, various groups uh, want a place at the table on campuses and the implications of all that. Um, you know, we've had a tremendous focus on student engagement through the whole uh, Nessie effort, the deep study, and so forth. That's changed our discussion uh, about design. Uh, a lot of the focus on sense of place that Jim uh, brings to this, I think, has, has changed. Uh, the big picture here is that the second volume focuses more explicitly on learning, student learning and how do you bring that about uh, and so you know the discussion on learning communities has certainly taken off um, and so if the first volume was more about how do you attract satisfy and make stable students on our campus the second one really turns that discussion for the purposes of learning um, and then finally uh, one of the biggest shifts as we all recognize has been the role of technology and the infusion of particularly these days mobile technology into our discussions about how students uh, learn. Um, one underlying piece to our work I think is the, the fundamental recognition and this was something that Jim sort of brought to all of our attention early on in, in this work and uh, that's recognizing that whether you understand them or not, campuses already have a design in place. Mm -hmm. So it's important to use these tools to understand, well, what is that design? How do I describe it? And what purpose does it serve? And that's where we sort of enter the conversation about how should we design campuses for various purposes. So um, in advance of today's show, uh, a, f a good friend of mine, Alex Lang, sent me a list of questions, and one of their questions was, how do the authors think that we can create integrated in-person and mobile environments versus separate and complementary? So I thought I'd insert that question now, since you talked about that specifically being a new component to uh, this particular edition. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and take a stab at that. Okay. So my, and then, I, Jim, I'll, I'll please chime in, too. Um, my first thought with that question is that they're already integrated. Mm -hmm. We just don't know that yet on a college campus. Uh, the academy has been slow to figure that one out. Um, you know, ironically, uh, colleges and universities where we, you know, our society has depended upon for creating new ideas and innovations of various kinds. They're among the most conservative institutions in our society. We like to keep what we have. And so anything new that comes along, uh, you know, it's a, it's a steep climb to justify it uh, in regard to where we are at the present. And so we look out our windows and we see these students carrying these little devices around in their hands and we see their their thumbs and fingers flying and communicating with one another and we say well look at what students are doing let's go do that and so I think we're at that step right now where we're seeing hey it's here on campus what can we do with that and uh, our first response was this is a distraction to learning uh, my response is no 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 this is in fact an attraction to learning for this generation and so it's a matter of uh, understanding and perhaps changing shifting our perspective towards that uh, potential of what can we do with this technology 
that will support our goals of learning. The, the goals of learning have not changed, but how we, how we uh, support them and how we reach them, I think, have changed. How about you, Jim? Well, my first response to it was, well, if you and I have the opportunity to uh, develop a third edition 13 years from now, <laughs> it would be fun to answer uh, that question as well. I think perhaps if uh, we can get over the conservative in nature of institutions that you've pointed out, that we might have some kind of virtual environment going on uh, and a whole new technology in 13 years or obviously much sooner than that. The other uh, response that uh, triggered for me was the fact that much of our model uh, uh, focuses uh, equally well or with some stretching uh, fairly well with the uh, mobile environment. Uh, when you look at uh, online courses or uh, interaction uh, in a variety of ways, there's a physical nature to that. Uh, wayfinding that we talk about in the book as wandering around campus trying to find your place. Uh, websites, wayfinding. Aggregate, who's on the line with you in this whole process? Uh, organization, how is the, the, this mobile environment put together? And does it really bring about a sense of community uh, from the perspective of the students? So, in a sense, uh, the mobile environment uh, is fairly well integrated with the model that we're talking about, primarily in terms of the on-campus uh, learning environment. So, uh, yeah, it's, it'll be fun to see what happens. Awesome. I, uh, maybe to add to that as well, um, I, I like looking at things from the 10,000 foot level and certainly American higher education is one of those opportunities. Um, the big picture for me, you know, much of what we do on a college campus today really dates back to uh, perhaps 11th century, even prior to that, uh, when a form of community life called monasticism uh, invited people to come and stay permanently in a place. And that's where learning took place. And uh, one of the commitments that members of a monastic community made was one of stability. And the Latin uh, phrase for that is stabilitas. That was the premium value. That was the model that uh, sort of laid foundations for the earliest universities. And essentially for the last, um, you know, six, seven centuries, that has been the predominant model, is you come to us, you stay with us, and this is where you will learn. Now, what technology has done, it's removed the need to be in a certain physical place in order to gain access to information. You know, prior to uh, uh, the printing presses, we had only an oral presentation. Then the printing presses produced books. People could take the books away and go read them somewhere else and then come back. Uh, now we have almost instant access to information, multiple sources at any time when you are ready in when it is relevant to you. And so uh, that's a new value. And I, I would name that uh, mobilitas rather than stabilitas to sort of take off on a, a coin Latin word. And so I think we're in the age of mobilitas where we're now asking as institutions how do we take what we offer and how do we come to you? Uh, and so I think both of those values are operant today. I think we're just beginning to understand uh, and we're certainly on the front edge of where this is going to lead us. I'm not sure, but I know we're not going back. I would agree. Uh, considering our mechanism for having this conversation today uh, as a case in point, uh, so, Jim, I assume that you all would like this text to be used within the profession, you know, in addition to graduate preparation programs, but also for, um, for programs, divisions of student affairs, um, or higher education broadly. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you intend it to be used and then what feedback you've received so far on, on the, uh, the newest edition? Sure. Uh, I think... Uh a number of programs across the country have been using the first edition and I assume they'll move to the second edition as a text. Uh, many of the courses are specific to 
uh, the campus environment, or in my case, I continue to teach campus ecology and use the book as a, a text. Uh, and generally, uh, the feedback has been very positive. Uh, I think the adjective that I find most often in student uh, responses is that the book is uh, very comprehensive and it covers areas that impact student affairs work outside of student development. And so I think it's uh, an addition that helps in, in, in that in that reference. The other thing, and Carney mentioned it earlier in a comment, is that uh, on occasion uh, I've looked up to see what some of the reading lists are on a variety of programs across the country and uh, was pleasantly surprised that some of the major institutions that have architectural programs have our book on their reading list. So uh, I think that uh, Basically, it's a text uh, for uh, student affairs programming. Uh, it's also, I think, has many opportunities within it uh, for staff development uh, issues for current uh, student affairs and then uh, for other uh, uh, disciplines. I think it also has um, some relevance. I think one of the things that uh, just to go back to one of your earlier questions in terms of the change of the book, uh, I think we moved a little bit from talking about the physical environment to the concept of place. And I think that has happened since the first uh, edition of the book, that place has become an important concept. Uh, a couple of reasons that I think that that is important and it lends to why maybe architects are interested in this is that one, uh, when you talk about physical space you tend to get into uh, pretty much the physical structures but when you talk about place uh, it allows that uh, Lewin formula to come into into being. That there's behavior going on there, there's persons going on there and there are environments. And secondly, I think when we talk about this, the notion of place, it connects us with us so many more disciplines. Uh, environmental psychology, ecological uh, psychology, uh, geography for sure. And I think that's a real uh, highlight in, of what might occur in the future is student affairs becoming more interested in and in understanding both uh, geography and anthropology and, and to get an, a different perspective on uh, the whole campus environment. So th those are probably the places that I see the book uh, being used. Great. So um, as, we, as we know from this week's incident, um, that is a continuation of a, of a series of, of climate issues on campuses. Uh, you know, campus environments do send a message about who belongs, who might not, um, can you talk a little bit about how some of these messages are conveyed through the environment um, which might lead towards inclusion or exclusion of, of certain groups um, and either the physical environment, the human aggregate environment, organizational, all of the elements um, and certainly the socially constructed environment. Carney, do you want to start with that? Well, one of the, you know, the most obvious and, and I'll sort of defer to Jim on uh, uh, some of the uh, questions about messages sent by the physical design and layout but uh, obviously the, you know the composition of a campus uh, in terms of its human aggregate who comes to school here and uh, you know that's that's a persistent challenge because anyone who does not share the dominant characteristics is always at risk that's inevitable uh, that is never completely solved until there's a critical mass but in order to get a critical mass there has to be a critical mass so it's it's a uh, it's a very difficult challenge and you know just declaring uh, diversification of an institution uh, important as it is doesn't solve it and so I think you know we uh, we have uh, seen ex uh, plenty of examples and we'll continue to see examples where people are feeling at risk, uh, feeling uh, as if they don't belong because they simply walk across campus and they don't see people like themselves. Um, and that's an important uh, contribution to being attracted to, satisfied, and stable within a setting. And if that's not uh, solved, 
you don't even get to first base in terms of learning uh, that goes on. Uh, the other piece has to do with the importance of diversity in achieving that sort of goal uh, in benefiting everyone's learning. Uh, that's a very important condition for exposing people to different backgrounds, different characteristics, to different viewpoints. Um, and without that, learning is simply a matter of rote. Uh, and so uh, as we, we think about challenges of of diversifying our campuses, uh, that certainly is an important ingredient. Jim, what are your thoughts? I know in the book you talk a lot about the physical uh, nature, curb cuts and blue light phones on campus that indicate safety and, and those kinds of things. Yeah, uh, well the physical environment sends messages very quickly in terms of safety and inclusion uh, for sure and in the book I think we talked about curb cuts, as you said. Um, but there are many, many uh, aspects of the physical environment that send uh, messages. I can just think of a, a, a couple of examples. Uh, when I have uh, done work for campuses, every time I see a handicapped access uh, sign, uh, I try it out. and. Uh, in many cases uh, it leads nowhere or it leads to a place that is no longer accessible. So we're raising expectations of being welcoming and it doesn't work and so that's a real uh, message. A uh, second uh, example would be I was at one institution and they built a building where there was a major concrete structure uh, and they put a message on the top of the structure, you walk under it, they put it that uh, something like be careful only six feet high and I thought to myself hmm they assume that there's no uh, visually impaired student over six foot tall and mm -hmm. uh, otherwise they they they, they were obviously it would be uh, struck in the head or on campuses where they pull out uh, the uh, maintenance equipment and put on the middle of the sidewalk and assume that people will walk around it but with a cane typically the front of the cane goes under the back end of the truck before so there's many many messages like that and then obviously one that relates to a lot of the issues around diversity that uh, Carney mentioned is graffiti uh, if I really want to understand uh, what's going on in terms of issues, uh, I spend a lot of time in restrooms on campus uh, and trying to get a sense of what is the nature of the inhabitants of this building and what are they putting on the uh, walls in, in the restrooms. And that's typically very enlightening uh, and uh, there are obviously messages that relate to both to safety and inclusion and certainly not encouraging uh, any involvement. So uh, the physical environment does send uh, these messages that uh, somehow we overlook if we're not paying attention to them. Yeah. So this um, concept of environmental press uh, you talk about in the book and and the feeling of belonging connected to that um, which in the book you define as a characteristic demand or feature of the environment as perceived by those who live in it. Um, can, can you give an example of you know, how the student needs might misalign and create this kind of press, uh, Jim, and, and knowing this, you know, what can student affairs uh, professionals do to help mitigate the effects of environmental press on, on certain student populations? I think about non-traditional students, um, commuter students, all those different groups. Well, I think the first thing is that student affairs uh, organizations uh, need to try to understand what are what is the press of this campus, and many times that question is is not raised within student affairs. We raise questions about students, but we don't raise questions about press. Uh, one fun uh, example uh, that I was involved in uh, was to send students out on campus and have them uh, write down every bumper sticker they found on campus. Okay. 
And we ended up with, I can't recall, somewhere near 2,000 bumper stickers. And we did a qualitative analysis. What's the thematic structure? In other, in other words, what's the press that's being presented by bumper stickers on campus? I called it bumper stick, sticker ethnography. But, uh, and it turned out there were two major themes for this campus. One was outdoor and sports. And the other was Christianity, okay? Church-related bumper stickers. So all of a sudden you have a press that if you are a member of the Christian Fellowship athletes, you're probably feeling pretty comfortable. But if you're not uh, of that issue of press, then you're probably feeling pretty uncomfortable. And uh, so I think it's important to find strategies for student affairs personnel to begin to understand and assess and scan, if you wish, what are the press uh, issues out there. Uh, it's always, a, you know, it's, it's, it's that relationship between press and individual. In some cases, the press works. In other cases, it creates uh, real issues of inclusion, real issues of safety. And certainly, it's hard to get involved if you feel the press is that you're not welcome. Yeah. Maybe to add to that too, uh, Heather, I I would suggest that it's not always about the entire institutional press, uh, although there are <clears throat> certainly good examples of that. Um, you know, some institutions tend to be highly competitive, uh, and so students automatically busy themselves with lots of activity in order to sort of move up or to, uh, you know, to compete. Um, but I think we need, we need to consider the very sub-environments all campuses have. And so in some ways, uh, this is a function of student groups, organizations, opportunities, and forms of, you know, centers of engagement where uh, most students are able to find uh, some sub-environment where the press is perhaps more compatible in that in in many ways compensates for what they experience in the larger press. Uh, I think uh, larger institutions, this is how, how most students solve that problem, is finding their niche, so to speak, uh, finding their place, their space. Uh, I often, uh, I used to say in jest when we, uh, the topic would come up of non-traditional late students and I would I would tell my students, well, just look for people with genes that don't have holes in them. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, uh, it's the attempt that non-traditional aid students uh, often have to sort of fit into the, uh, the press of the youth culture and to sort of feel normal, you know, in, uh, in their uh, pursuit of education at a non-traditional age. Um, so... I think helping people realize that there are ways of adapting to presses as well as changing presses or at least steering people to uh, sources where the press would be more compatible. I think that that's important. So, you know, we have commuter student centers, we have adult learner uh, organizations, and, and so forth. Those are all helpful, I think, in uh, matching person and environment. One of the notions that came to me a few years ago and I wrote just a very small informal article about that perhaps the role model for student affairs ought to be the travel agent and when the student comes in uh, they want to get some place and the student affairs person ought to know what these sub environments these niches are and help them to find those places so the travel agency might be a, a uh, sort of a working model uh, in order to uh, find their place on campus. So we had a question via Twitter that relates to your discussion about graffiti, uh, Jim. Andy Gilbert asks that do we do you believe that routinely erasing messages of graffiti, removing them, um, especially those that are non-inclusive or aggressive, could combat that environment? Well, that's a Sounds like an easy question, but it is not. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll give you my take on uh, graffiti uh, removal. One is I don't think we ought to ever remove it without first reading it and understanding what is about. 
what, why was this put there, who put it there, what are the issues that are uh, surrounding this. So graffiti is another way uh, how the environment communicates to us. Sometimes it's a, a cry for help, sometimes it's a, a, it's a uh, speaking in anger, but we should read it first of all uh, and try to understand it. Second, I think that if it's, uh, and this is hard to uh, operationalized, but if it is extremely uh, negative uh, toward individuals and groups, then there ought to be a fairly quick removal of, of that. Uh, it creates all the issues we talk about in the book in terms of safety and in inclusion. If it's in some ways, however, you have to be a little careful about removal in that many times what you also removing is the educational experience that it could occur around that piece of graffiti. How can we take this and make it a, a educational uh, experience uh, for the campus? Uh, so my thoughts are one, uh, read it, understand it, try to two, uh, remove it as quickly as possible uh, but three, think about the educational opportunities that it, it, it might uh, create. I always think about um, when, when you were talking about my role, my previous role working in a women's center and when there were things on campus, you know, the opportunity to have dialogue around that and bring together students who were, who were concerned and then to mobilize their own speech act, right? Or, not necessarily graffiti, but to, to use that as an opportunity to talk about um, their perception of the environment and their lived their lived experience on that campus as a member of that particular group. So, uh, great. Sometimes we just don't use the uh, experience to for educational uh, or aware increased awareness or increased sensitivity. Uh, so uh, that's always a fine line to define, but uh, uh, those are my thoughts at least. Great. I think Great. Jim's uh, comments sort of underscore the importance that failure to act is not an option. Uh, it's, it's either uh, remove, educate, understand, those are the only the options uh, in that um, I think as we s are seeing at the University of Missouri this week, um, failure to act uh, led to much of uh, was certainly a precipitator of many of the events that have occurred. Absolutely. So this brings us to the, conver the conversation about organizations and static organizations versus developmental environments. Um, Carney, you talk about this extensively in the book. Um, can you talk a little bit about what I either of those are and then, you know, is there times when a static environment might be better or preferred? Um, or vice versa when a developmental organization or developmental environment would be preferred? Sure. Um, you know, all uh, we have to work in organizations. Organizations uh, serve great purposes and organizations also go through uh, cycles of uh, just like inhale versus exhale and uh, much of that has to do with uh, their own characteristics of size, uh, the availability of resources or lack thereof, and the kind of cycles that feed into uh, higher education uh, that tend to challenge and change uh, those kinds of things. Um, the distinction that I offer there is is the difference between a mechanistic versus organic, and that's a uh, a rather large continuum there, lots of different styles and options in between. And so um, there comes a time, and, and particularly in Western culture, we tend to rely on what we call um, um, the uh, types of uh, culture, low context culture. And uh, this is a culture that likes to write things down. And so we we tend to and I you know we do this a lot in student affairs. We have uh, shelves full of manuals how to do this and that. Uh, we have three ring binders full of 
the, uh, here's the procedure for this and that. So we write things down, and eventually we fix them into a codified version of how things go. And um, you know, when organizations get to that point, uh, a lot of energy is spent on preserving what is there. Again, the conservative nature of our institutions, and that works uh, for a while. And you know, things sort of hum along, and we, as administrators, we like that. We like when when things function well, and uh, you know, things get done, uh, reports get written, achievements are noted, and so on. Uh, there does come a time, sometimes this comes with uh, new leadership, is that it's time to sort of uh, step back and loosen things a bit and perhaps institute more organic procedures. You know, we, we've moved from hierarchies to teams uh, in some places with different impact and effect. And uh, the goal of all of this is innovation, I think, and creativity, which is at the heart of what we do as educators, uh, either creating ourselves or getting students to create. And to do that, they need to be included uh, and they need to be engaged. And uh, generally speaking, organic opportunities uh, provide the most freedom for that possibility. Uh, is there a role for more mechanistic uh, you know, times? Sure. Um, sometimes organizations find themselves in a position where uh, what was yesterday's idea is no longer today's idea, nor will it be tomorrow's idea. And the sense of uh, sort of uh, everything falling through the cracks and fingers, uh, sometimes it's important to step back and say, all right, let's get this down. Let's agree on how we're going to do this. And uh, let's bring a little bit of stability back in for a while. Uh, I think this is particularly uh, a question that concerns us when resources are diminished. Um, so when we, uh, we need a, a stronger sense of accountability and, uh, in order to justify uh, how we are spending our time and our resources. Um, so I think having that paradigm in mind, you know, from mechanistic to uh, more organic, I think it's important to recognize the the timing of that, uh, the impact of that, you know, know that when you become more mechanistic, you're going to diminish creativity and innovation in the, in the big picture. And that you can survive for a while uh, with that kind of model. Eventually, you're going to need to open things up to engage people in new ways and creative ways of thinking and problem solving. Great. Um, so I'm going to move on to talking about some specific kind of functional areas. We have uh, folks watching today from residence life and student unions, campus rec centers. These are, you know, the physical environments. In fact, um, a member of the ACUI staff uh, forwarded me a book review of your book um, from Dr. T.J. Willis uh, speaking about kind of how this relates uh, to campus union work. Uh, we're going to tweet out a link to that review here in a second. But specifically, you know, how would you help members of these various, you know, really strongly physical environment work um, talk about uh, and, and assess the students' perceptions um, of the socially constructed environment within these spaces, so within residence halls? Um, you know, do you have any mechanisms that you would uh, recommend? A couple of things I'll share, and then I'm sure Carney will have some additional ideas to toss in. Uh, one would be uh, the concept that we talk about in the book called behavioral traces. And that is what behaviors have students been engaged in as determined by what kind of traces they've left over. And so everyone who has a student affairs function in a physical environment can certainly do that on a continuing daily basis. How has the furniture be rearranged? Why was it arranged that way? Is it more social pedal, more social fugal? Does it bring people together? Does it separate people? Uh, why is the carpet worn out in this direction and not this direction? So I think there's all kinds of behavioral trace observations within residence halls, certainly within uh, uh, student unions, 
uh, that would lead to that. The second piece is that uh, I don't want to take up too much time to talk about the campus design uh, matrix, but uh, those who have the book, uh, it's uh, figure 9.1. Uh, those cells in this model uh, are places. They're places. And you can go and visit those places. What is the physical environment that's most negative towards safety? Where is that on campus? Staff can do that. Students can do that. You can take photographs of that, bring it back. So, you know, this is not, uh, there are a lot of what I would call low tech ways to understand what's going on in your physical environment. Take a look at traces and go visit these places. Carney, do you have any thoughts on this? Sure, I would add to that. Uh, you know, wherever you carry out your work as an educator, whether it be in a residence hall, whether it uh, be in a student union, et cetera, you need to consider that as an environment in which you function that has an impact on the, those who engage in it in one way or another. And so um, it's important to think of that as a perhaps a contained environment that needs uh, and warrants some assessment. Uh, I think that there are just a lot of possibilities out there, whether it be everything from a uh, a quick uh, on-the-spot survey uh, distributed through mobile uh, technology to individuals as they engage in, in whatever experience it is. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of possibilities there to sort of real time. Uh, I uh, uh, have been interested in some of the mobile technology packages that are available on college campuses. Now one of which is called Campus Quad and uh, that has uh, blended the social networking with uh, student engagement and real-time analytics and to be able to use that as a tool within a setting I think has some tremendous possibilities. Uh, one of the the first forms of environmental assessment and, and Jim you remember this from your witchy days was what was called an environmental referent and yeah. That was a global sort of item that you can ask any student uh, in reference to a particular setting. Maybe it's a residence hall where uh, you know the stimulus is this is the best residence hall possible and the, where they agree or to disagree. And then you follow up with the question, what is it about this place that leads you to respond that way? And so that often brings a lot of uh, uh, material forward that you don't necessarily anticipate or that you can use to confirm. Uh, there are a number of sort of standardized assessment uh, protocols that could be used. Uh, you know, Rudolf Moos uh, was uh, uh, created a number of these sort of instruments uh, related to work environments, to social groupings, to residence environments. That at least gives you uh, sort of an empirical framework within which to interpret findings. So I think there are a variety of ways uh, and I would begin with a simple uh, sort of assessment uh, much like uh, use of an environmental referent where you can get some immediate clues and from there build on uh, your understanding of what's going on there. Yeah, in terms of the environmental referent, uh, one of the things that I have my uh, campus ecology students is, is to take a look at a particular uh, subsetting and come up with environmental reference in their meanings and then look through the entire list and see if there are some thematic structures within that environmental reference. Right. Uh, the place is dirty or the place is clean, the place is structured, the place is dynamic. All of those themes can emerge out of some kind of sort of qualitative thematic analysis of the uh, meaning of the reference. So I think another thing to underline is some of this can be really fun and uh, to try to find out what's going on, how it's, uh, how can I take a picture of this, how can I take this back to a group so that we can have some discussion of, I wonder what this means kind of thing. I think that is a, a level of activity that has a high degree of fun and I think we need more of that and as we proceed in some of these more difficult issues. Well, especially considering how easy it is to get photos today. and I mean, you could just yes. look at Instagram accounts across campus mm -hmm. and, and see what students are documenting. So that could be 
data, right? Um, right. As I, a, was, as a I was suggesting to Courtney earlier that uh, you know we need to set up a new student affairs assessment office that just sits there all day and receives pictures of what's working and what's not working, what is not safe, what is safe, what is this is not including me, what are you going to do about it? Just have a, a depository of all of these Instagrams and uh, Twit pictures and all those kinds of things. It, it would be a you know minute by minute view of the campus environment throughout the day and the evening. Yeah. Yeah, using, whether you wanted it or not, too. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Using that campus design um, matrix as kind of the, the conceptual framework, do, do you know of any ways that that's been translated into an activity sheet or a worksheet um, to be used with students? Uh, this is another question from my friend Alex Lang. Or maybe that's well, a possibility. I'm, I'm sure that it has. No one has written to me and said, do this. Uh, and so uh, I, I have no doubt that people have taken this. And uh, I've seen some efforts uh, around the uh, hierarchy of environmental design. I mean, those are more fundamental questions. Who's included here? Who's at risk? Who's engaged? Who's not? Who experiences a uh, uh, sense of community in their, their life there? And so, uh, you know, I, I would just say that I'm assuming that, yes, People are doing these kinds of things, but do we have a uh, a tool that you could buy for two dollars ninety five cents? No, well, that's a great idea. <laughs> this is your retirement fund, right? <laughs> I have found some campuses. I've organized uh, small groups of students and faculty to go out and essentially take pictures that would fill in, uh, but. Uh, some of the cells of, of, of the matrix, but it's been uh, much more broad and not quite as specific. So, like Carney, uh, I know it's out there, but uh, I haven't seen what people are using. But you know, this this is a, a perfect example of uh, my earlier conclusion that um, technology has already integrated itself into our educational systems. We just haven't figured out how to use it. But you know, Instagram and so on. There's a a perfect technique there that we could use in some way to evaluate uh, the impact and uh, the experience that students have in these environments called colleges and universities. So once we start tracking, um, I know for me at least it's a matter of awareness and then once you start noticing it's everywhere, right? You start seeing environmental messages um, streaming all the time. Um, and I think it's it's positive, right? You know, we don't, you don't want to turn that off. But how can those who are watching today um, strategically make those who have the ability to make positive change aware of the concerns that we're seeing? Because I think um, sometimes it's you know that we just need some strategies of how to communicate that. Do you have any suggestions for folks that are um, on the call? Carney, you want to start? Okay. Well. Awareness of these things uh, doesn't change them. Uh, lack of awareness doesn't change them either. And so I think that, uh, much like with the questions of how do students learn, develop, and grow, that's a very important question that, uh, over the last 20 years, changed the conversation on a college campus, where we quit talking so much about how to teach, and we started talking about how do students learn. And uh, out of that has come some tremendous innovations I think on the college campus from ranging from learning communities now to active learning classrooms and all of that. So it's important for us to take that awareness uh, and not block it out but bring it to the table. You know with with the awareness of uh, the hierarchy of uh, environmental design and certainly the matrix being able to translate that language into examples on your respective campuses and to make sure those important questions are being asked at the table as we consider policies and practices. Uh, I'm astounded from time to time as I see uh, a couple of universities uh, shall remain unnamed but uh, that have gone to great lengths to build 30 plus story residence halls. Now that's a result of not having this awareness and understanding the impact of campus environments on somebody's you know, uh, watch. And uh, I have no doubt that in the long run those will fail much like they did in the 60s as we couldn't build them fast enough. 
now we can't tear them down fast enough. Um, and so I think it's it's a matter of bringing these questions in an organized way to our conversations about what we're doing. I think maybe the other side of the coin, uh, just briefly, is that and in, in, as well as increasing our abilities to assess environments, uh, we need to increase our ability to listen. Uh, mm. to those who have assessed it. And many of the issues as we now read about across the campus, as, uh, across the country, are failure to listen or failure mm. to communicate, the failure to get to community. And that, so in, in addition to what do we do with this, how can we listen to it? Yeah. It's um, maybe as a final note on that, um, I often uh, would tell my students that when I teach them theory, they're not going to learn anything new, but they will learn to organize what they know already. And I think 